uh, first of all, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Valeria, for uh, number one, for inviting me uh, to be part of this. I'm incredibly honored and privileged to get a chance to sort of talk to the people over there. I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end, but you know, the first thing I just want to start off by saying is, you know, obviously uh, everyone around the world has incredible support for Ukraine. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but I just want you to begin by stating, you know, we're, we're all with you. Um, I wanted to sort of just spend today just telling you about a little bit about me and a little bit about why we received the Nobel Prize uh, recently at the end of last year. Um, uh, but to begin with, I thought I'd just tell you about myself, who I am, why, why am I talking to you right now? So my name is David McMillan. Uh, I'm not, even though I live in the United States, I'm not from the US. I, I grew up in Scotland and this is a, a map that I always like to show people, um, especially for Americans who don't know where Scotland is. But Scotland, as you might know, is in the United Kingdom and it's in the very top part. Um, while we have a, a large land mass, we're actually a pretty small population, just about 5 million people, a much, much smaller population than England, who's the country to the south of us. Uh, I grew up uh, just outside of one of the two cities in Scotland. Uh, you might know there's four cities in Scotland, the, the two biggest ones are Glasgow and Edinburgh. And, and I grew up in Belsell, which are just outside of Glasgow, which is a very small population. I always like to show this, this map of where I grew up. Um, this is again, mainly for Americans. Uh, when people visit Scotland, they always go to visit Edinburgh. They very rarely go to Glasgow or to where I live. But this is just to show that it's really easy to go from, from Edinburgh to where I live. And it's, it's, a, it's a very nice place. Uh, growing up, I was a very much working class kid. I grew up in a working class family in a working class village, and I had a very, very happy, happy childhood growing up. Growing up there, uh, even though we were working class, we had a great time. There was great humor and great personality from the people uh, everywhere we around us. And I always like to show this house uh, where I grew up. Um, this is what's called a council house. Um, in Scotland. Council house means that you don't own your house, but the, the government give you a house because you can't own your own. And it was a great place to grow up. And I love to show this picture uh, just because in America, people always ask me, why am I only showing half the house? And I always tell them, because we only had half a house. That's the way houses were set up in Scotland. And it was a really fantastic place to grow up. So I was born uh, to you and all the people listening, I was born a long time ago, 1968. Um, and these were some photographs that the Nobel Foundation asked, could I send some photographs of when I was a kid so that they could see them? And these photographs are now on the Nobel, the Nobel website. But it turns out I didn't actually have any of these photographs. So I had to ask my sister to send them to me. And I'm still really worried that the photograph on the left is actually, a, I'm pretty sure it's a photograph of my sister and not of me. And I think this is a great uh, practical joke that she's probably played that there's a picture of her on the Nobel, the Nobel Foundation website. I'm not sure. Anyway, this is a picture of me as a baby and as a young kid growing up in Scotland. Uh, in the middle, this is an unusual sunny day in Scotland. It's not sunny that often, but this is one sunny day. Uh, when I was a young kid, I went to elementary school had a really great childhood. Again, really grew up playing soccer, playing football every day. I'm a huge, huge uh, football fan. And then much like the people who are on the call today, I, I went to high school and, and I went to a place called Belsall Academy. And I had a really, really fun time there as well. And when I was growing up as a kid, the way that you would try and uh, become successful, at least at the beginning, the only way that we knew of was to try and be join a join a band and play music. And this was myself as a photograph playing music in a band when I was a, when I was a pretty young kid. But as part of the story, that was just a sort of I had a very sort of ordinary but happy childhood growing up in Scotland. But when I was young or when I was a teenager, this is a, a photograph of my older brother, and he decided to do something that was pretty remarkable. At least we thought it was pretty remarkable. 
when he was uh, 18, he decided that he wanted to go to university. Now, in Scotland, this, for me, this was really remarkable because we didn't know anyone in our village or in our town. We didn't know anyone who'd ever gone to university before. And this was quite controversial for my family because uh, my mom and dad thought he was being lazy because he didn't want to go to, to, to work. But he decided he wanted to go to university. And four years later, he graduated from university. And in fact, he graduated with a degree in physics. But what was the important point or very important point of this uh, was that the first day he started his job after leaving university, he received a, a larger salary than my father, who was a steel worker, and my mom, who was a maid. Their salaries combined was less than the salary my brother made in his new job. And from that day on, my family told me I had to go to university. The decision was decided for me because my brother was the first person to do that. So when I was 18, I went off to the University of Glasgow um, to, do, to study physics. You can tell this is the 1980s, but if you look at my hair, it's so far off of my head, it's really huge. It's a clear giveaway that this is the 1980s. And I went there to do, to do physics, but very quickly I realized I really didn't like physics. Everyone told me I had to do it because that was what my brother did, but quickly I realized I really didn't enjoy it. But fortunately, another lectures that I would take was also in chemistry. And it turns out when I started to do organic chemistry, I really loved it. And over time, I realized that that was really my passion. And I also was in this wonderful class of people who also enjoyed doing chemistry. And this was a really wonderful time in my life where I was allowed to grow up and learn with all your friends. And one of the things I've learned in life is that making great friendships as you go through your education is really important. You can also tell this is the 1980s. Again, you can see these, these big hairstyles. So at the end of this, uh, I decided that I wanted to do a PhD. But I also decided I really wanted to try and live in America. I'd grown up watching American TV my whole life. I really loved American sports. I decided I really wanted to, to move to America. So I wrote letters to many different academics in America asking if I could come and do a PhD. And no one would ever write back. I ended up writing 18 letters, no one wrote back. And eventually I was about to give up, but then I wrote a 19th letter to someone called Hal Moore at UC Irvine. And he wrote back and he said, look, you can't get a PhD by writing a letter. You have to fill out an application form. And he sent me an application form and I was accepted. And I went to California. I moved from Scotland, just outside Glasgow to California. And this was where I spent my PhD from 1990 to 1996. And it was really a fantastic time. And that's one of the reasons that I really love science and I love education is it becomes a passport that allows you to, to go and experience so many things in the world. And it's why it's important to stay involved in education and stay involved in learning because it allows you to travel and see lots of people all around the world. And I had a, a really just fantastic time in Southern California. Okay, so that's the beginning of my story. I'm gonna jump forward now to just the end of last year when I found out that I, I won a Nobel Prize. And just after I won the Nobel Prize, uh, I started to receive lots of questions. But the, the number one question that people have asked me has been about this idea that we won the Nobel Prize for, asymmetric organocatalysis. And everywhere I go, people ask me, what on earth does this mean? So what I thought I would do for today was to try and explain this in not so technical terms, what is asymmetric organocatalysis? So the first part is what is catalysis? Well, to understand catalysis, it's actually pretty easy. The first thing to know is that around you right now, everywhere in the world, everything is made from chemical reactions. This is a photograph of my office here at Princeton. You can see it behind me. And every component, every material in my office is made from a different chemical reaction. If I focus in on one of them, this reaction, which is shown here, this is actually the chemical reaction to make caffeine. Caffeine is the key stimulant that you find when you take your, your coffee every morning. Now, that's a chemical reaction. And for most chemical reactions to happen, they typically require energy. 
Most of them don't happen spontaneously, including the one to make caffeine. Now, the way we show this is called an energy diagram. And I'm, I'm not going to get into too much technical detail, but I like to show this, this picture to explain the energy. And the way I like to explain it, especially to high school students and to undergraduates, is the idea of thinking, if you're walking home every night, and every night to get home, you have to walk over a really large hill. To do that would obviously require a lot of energy every single night. But imagine if you could somehow build a tunnel and the tunnel would go through the hill, that would make it so much faster and so much easier to get home every night. And that's exactly what catalysis does for chemical reactions. Catalysis makes existing reactions easier, it makes them faster, in many cases, it allows chemical reactions that were previously impossible now become possible. So you may ask, uh, does chemical reactions and does catalysis, do these things impact our world? And they impact our world in many different ways. Um, this is one of my favorite ways to show this. This is the population of Earth over the last 2,000 years. And you can see it's pretty stable over that time frame. But at the beginning of the 20th century, you see there's an inflection. There's an inflection where the number jumps all the way up to 8 billion people. Now, as it happens, you could not have 8 billion people on our world. It would not be sustainable without catalysis. And this catalytic reaction, which is shown here, which is converting nitrogen over to ammonia. So why do we need this catalytic reaction so, so badly? Well, we need it because that makes ammonia and we need ammonia to make food and we would not have enough food for 8 billion people on our planet if it was not for this one catalytic reaction. One of my favorite pieces of trivia about this catalytic process is if you think about your own body and you think about all the proteins, you think about all that DNA, you think about all that tissue that all contains nitrogen atoms, 50% of those nitrogen atoms actually come from this catalytic process, which is performed in a factory. Now, other ways that catalysis is important is that 90% of all industrial scale chemical reactions use catalysis. And at the moment, 35% of the world's GDP is based on catalysis. And that number is only going to increase as we move into the next couple of decades and we move towards more sustainable processes. Other ways that catalysis is important, I've shown you already that we have to use it for the world's food supply. For medicines, we use catalysis every day to make medicines. For renewable energy, solar cells, that requires catalysis. And even materials, all the materials around us, generally based upon using catalysis. So clearly, I hope you would agree catalysis is important. So the next question becomes, well, what about asymmetric? What does asymmetric mean? Well, asymmetric sounds very technical, but it's actually pretty easy to understand. And it's easy to understand because you can simply look at your two hands to understand what asymmetric means. Now, if you look at your two hands and you ask yourself, are they identical? They sort of look like they're identical, but we know they're different. They're different because they're mirror images of each other. And that means that they're similar, but they are different. But this being a mirror image, we can tell they're different because we know if you were to take your left hand glove, which fits on your left hand, if we try and put that on your right hand, we know that that glove does not recognize your right hand. It just doesn't fit. Now that's called asymmetric. The part that's important about this for chemistry, it, as it happens in organic chemistry, organic molecules also often exist as mirror images of each other. So here are two molecules, they're organic molecules, they're mirror images of each other. Now, what's fascinating about this is if you go into a lab and you try to tell those molecules apart, they're so similar, it's very difficult to tell them apart. And you have to use a very expensive piece of equipment that takes about maybe $50,000, $60,000, takes about 20 minutes for it to actually be able to separate these molecules from each other. But what's also very interesting, this is a photograph of my daughter when she was three years old. When she was three years old, she could differentiate these molecules literally in a picosecond simply by smelling them. So why is that? Why is it in a lab it's so difficult to differentiate these molecules? However, for even a small child, it's very simple. 
was very simple because of our bodies, because of biology. And in our bodies, it turns out that all of our body is really made up of one mirror image of molecules and not the other mirror image. And just like the way the glove can recognize the hand, our bodies can recognize the differences between these two different mirror images. So that has really important implications, not just obviously for your hands, but also for things like medicine. You realize that medicines, in fact, can exist as mirror images. And while one of the mirror images can be useful and basically good for you, it's good for your health, the other mirror image can be detrimental, it can be dangerous, it can be toxic. So as such, it becomes really important to be able to make one of these mirror images without making the other one. So how would we make them? Well, clearly we'd want to use catalysis and that's why we call it asymmetric catalysis. That's where the name comes from. Okay, the last part, organo. What does organo mean? Well, for this part of the story, I'm gonna go back to 1996. This will fit back into my timeline. I'll explain why in a few moments. But in 1996, to perform catalysis, asymmetric catalysis, there was really only two different ways of doing it. The first way was to use biocatalysis, which is to use the, the catalysts of life. These are enzymes that you'd find in animals. And you could use these enzymes to do this type of catalysis. The second one was to use a man-made way of doing catalysis, and this involved using metals. This had been designed over a few decades but also was a way of performing catalysis. So why 1996? Well, 1996 is where my story begins again. As I told you, I was in Southern California. I finished my PhD and I was very lucky to finish it because I was working for this uh, mentor. His name is Larry Overman. He's one of the, the best chemists you could ever meet, but he's also a fantastic human being, a fantastic teacher. And one of the things I've learned in life is really paying attention to teachers and educators is so important because they can really provide so much, so many different ways about thinking, not just about science, but life in general. So I left Irvine in 1996 and I moved across America to Harvard to do postdoctoral studies. And I joined the labs of this gentleman. His name is Dave Evans. Dave Evans is one of the most influential, most brilliant chemists that really ever exist and had a huge influence over science over the last three decades. And I joined Dave and I joined his team because I wanted to learn about doing asymmetric catalysis. And in particular, Dave's lab were masters of using metals to do this type of catalysis. So I learned uh, just an enormous amount from Dave. I learned an enormous amount from his team. But every day that I would show up, I would have to work using this contraption. Now, you may know what this is, but we call this a glove box. And a glove box is basically a box, and inside of it, it has what we call inert gases. It has inert gases because it has compounds or chemicals inside of it that we cannot allow to be around water, around air, or around oxygen, because they will destroy those chemicals. So it's really important those chemicals are kept in this box where they can't see water or air or moisture. And that's really important for them. But the problem is that to work with them, you have to put your hands in this box and you have to put your hands in this box for hours and hours and hours every single day. So after about two years of this, I started to think, why are we spending so much time in a glove box every single day? So the reason is, if you actually look at this typical catalyst, this is a typical metal catalyst. And if you look at it, you can start to realize you can actually split it right down the middle into two different parts. Now, on the right-hand side would be the part which is the metal. Now, in some cases, not all cases, but some cases, metals can be expensive, they can be toxic, they can be really difficult to work with because they cannot be out in our environment, and they're also not sustainable. If you take them out of the earth, it's difficult to put them back in again. However, in contrast, if you look at the, the left-hand part of this catalyst, this is actually the organic molecules. These are typically inexpensive, they're safe, they're sustainable. And as such, I started to think, what if we only use the organic part as the catalyst without using the metal part on the right-hand side? And eventually this became known as organocatalysis. Okay. So in 1998, I landed a job as an assistant professor. 
as an assistant professor, my job was in Berkeley out in California. And I moved over there in 1998. And this is a photograph of my very young group in our very first year. And I, I really love this photograph because you can see it's 10 past 10. It's a Friday night. We're all in lab, this young group trying to make a difference. So what did we decide to work on? Well, we decided we wanted to work on organocatalysis. So all of the reasons were, to me, seemed reasonably straightforward. Uh, first of all, we, what was nice about this is that all of these catalysts should be readily available from nature's building blocks, amino acids and proteins and things like that. Because these molecules already exist out in our environment, they should not be sensitive to air, they should be not sensitive to water. Because they're so abundant, they should be inexpensive. Because they can exist in our environment, you shouldn't have to use these contraptions such as glove boxes every day. And then last, they should be recyclable. They come from organic, they come from basically life form, as such, they should be able to re-enter back into the life cycle once so as such, they could be completely sustainable. But the original reason that I really wanted to do this was the idea that instead of developing one organocatalyst to perform one chemical reaction, I was really interested in the idea, could you use this to perform maybe 10, maybe hundreds of different reactions? And maybe this would lead to a new field of catalysis. That was a pretty, grandiose idea. And to be honest, I had absolutely no idea on how to do it. But fortunately, one day when we were in lab, uh, this is one of my young graduate students at the time. His name is Tristan Lambert. He's now a very successful professor at Cornell University. But back when he was a first year graduate student, he came up to me to ask a, a simple question about organic chemistry. The question is, what is the mechanism of reductive amination? As a young professor, I sort of ran to the board to sort of teach this young student what the mechanism was. And I wrote this down on the board, I said it's a carbonyl and an amine, and it goes back and forward. It's reversible with an aminium ion. And when it forms an aminium ion, it only then has the electronics which are required to do the subsequent chemistry. And it was right then, right there, I had the quintessential eureka moment. I had the eureka moment. I always thought those things were made up. But I actually had my own eureka moment. And the eureka moment was I realized you could use this for organocatalysis because if you were to do the same thing with these alpha, beta, and saturated aldehydes, that looks very similar to a field of catalysis that uses metals in which hundreds of reactions had been developed, but there was no examples using organic catalysts. To show that in a slightly more conventional way, if you look at these two equations, the equation on the top uses the M for metals, and there was literally hundreds of reactions which had been developed using this catalysis idea. But on the bottom equation, there was basically no examples to doing that. But if these were actually simultaneous equations, that means the equation on the bottom should actually work for literally hundreds of reactions, the less we go on and on and on. So we decided we had to try it. We decided we wanted to try it that afternoon. But the question is, which reaction should we test it on? So the chemical reaction we wanted to test it on was this one, which is shown here. It's the Diels-Alder reaction. It's one of the most famous chemical reactions in the world. It deservedly won the Nobel Prize in 1950 because it allows you to take really simple molecules and make them into much more complex molecules that you can use for materials, you can use for medicines. So we thought this would be a great reaction to test this idea. So off we went. This is the notebook page of the first person in my group to try this. Her name was Kateria Wren. She's a first year graduate student. And if you look at the notebook page, you can see there's an arrow. And above the arrow, there is the organic molecule, which is going to be the catalyst. So this is our first attempt of trying it. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see the result. And the result says, not racemic, not racemic. What does that mean? Well, not racemic means it makes more of one mirror image than the other one. This was incredibly exciting. I remember going into my office, closing the door, jumping up and down for five minutes. I remember calling my wife, telling her I was so excited that we'd actually been able to do this. But when my feet came back to the ground, I sort of realized that if you look at the very top, the initial result says 48%. What does that mean? 
Well, that 48% means that we made 48% more of one of the mirror images than the other one. And if the chemistry community, if the chemistry world was going to take us seriously, this number would have to be 90%. So we had to decide, what are we going to do? Are we going to publish this? Or are we going to go for the, the home run, for the, the, the gusto, and try and get this to 90? We decided to try and make it up to 90, which is a very nerve-wracking six months for us. But eventually, we came to this catalyst. This catalyst is a very straightforward catalyst to make. And I can show you because it's made from two things. It's made from artificial sweetener, which is phenylalanine. Um, and it's also made from acetone. Acetone is paint stripper or basically the, the, basically the, the material you use to remove nail polish from your fingers. Very, very inexpensive. But the reason we really liked this catalyst, because when we tried it, it worked. It gave 90% for a whole range of reactions. So at this point, I was a young professor. I'm really excited about this result. And I want to publish this. And I want to publish this in a good journal. And I want to climb to the highest sort of rooftop and tell everyone about how great this is. And you can sort of see this in this paper, this very first paper that we put together. And the first thing we did is we actually came up with a name. We came up with the name organocatalysis. And you might ask, is naming things important? And names and language is very, very important. And I can explain that in different ways. But my favorite way is to show you this scientist from the 1800s. He's Swedish, called Jean Jacob Berzelius. And he actually came up with so many modern terms that you now see in the vocabulary across chemistry. Things like catalysis or protein, polymer organic, inorganic, he came up with all of these terms. And this idea of giving an identity to a field has sort of carried on even into the modern era. Things like machine learning, AI, nanotechnology, organocatalysis. These are words that give an umbrella term that help you define a field and let fields grow beneath them. So that was great. But the other part of this paper I was really excited about, it introduced the concept of a generic activation mode. And that sounds like a really technical term, but it's, a, it's actually a very simple idea. A generic activation mode just means, can we use one catalyst to not do one reaction, but to do hundreds of reactions? Would that be possible? So we set off to test that. We'd already performed this one reaction. So now we wanted to see would it do many others. And it went bang, bang, stop. It just stopped after three. And again, this was really disappointing. But this happens a lot in science where you get the proof of concept with one catalyst and sometimes you have to go back and redesign things to come up with the much better catalyst. So that's what we did. And I was really fortunate to have two fantastic young people in my group, two fantastic young graduate students, Joel Austin and Chris Bortz, and they performed what I would call precision molecular engineering. And what I mean by that is if you look at the catalyst in the top left, they actually took away two carbons and they reinstalled four carbons in a slightly different shape. This is really precision molecular engineering. Now, my favorite way to sort of describe this to people who are not chemists is to talk about football. Uh, one of my favorite footballers is Zlatan Ibrahimovic. I think he's a football god. And I always love to show this goal. Um, I like this goal because he scores from the over 40 yard line. It's an amazing goal. I'll show that one more time. I also like this. It's, it's a Swedish player, but obviously he's playing in the same colors of Ukraine, which I think is also awesome. And I just love that goal. And I love it because it's a precision piece of athleticism, which gives you a beautiful outcome. And we're trying to do this precision engineering to get a beautiful outcome. So uh, basically we went from our first catalyst to our second catalyst, and now we tried it and ba-boom. We were off to the races. Now we could get hundreds of reactions. And what was very fortunate was Jorgensen and Hayashi also came along. They developed a fantastic catalyst. And this amplified this to an even larger extent. Literally hundreds of reactions were now possible. So this was very, very exciting for us. But at the present time, you may say, well, what other types of reactivity can be enabled with organocatalysis? And one other way that we've started to really develop this is to ask the question, can we use light and all the ways that we've learned about trying to store energy from sunlight to power our planet, can we use those same ideas to actually develop chemical reactions that you can use for medicines or for materials? 
And this is something that's became known as photoredox catalysis. And we do a lot of this in my lab now. This has been a really very much exciting area for us. And I love to show this slide because just the sheer colors of it just look like it's almost like a Frankenstein type lab. It's a really sort of beautiful form visually of chemistry to perform. Okay, so what are the applications of organocatalysis around the world? Well, there's many different ones, but I'm only just gonna show you a few. The first one is for flavors and fragrances um, as, as well as um, basically perfumes. Now you might think flavors and fragrances, perfumes, are those important, but around the world, those are made on an enormous scale every day. And if you can lower the energy costs for doing that, that actually has a significant impact. And Fermanish, who's this fantastic company have, who make uh, flavors and fragrances, they have used organocatalysis uh, on 400 metric ton scale in Northern India to make perfumes, some of them called Lily of the Valley, other ones which have these beautiful uh, rose smell associated with these perfumes, really fantastic. Another way that organocatalysis is being used is for the recyclable plastic economy. You may have heard about why plastics are beginning to sort of pollute our oceans. In fact, plastics are starting to pollute everywhere. And it's becoming really important that we think about recycling them. And this really wonderful work from Bob Weymouth and James Hedrick is the idea of using organocatalysis to take polymers and break them back down to monomers. And if you can do that, then you can then remake them into polymers and the whole thing now becomes recyclable, which is really, really important. But the main application, the main reason that people use uh, organocatalysis is for medicines. This is one example. This is a molecule from Merck, which is uh, employed for migraine. Uh, you might know that there's an enormous number of people all over the world suffers from migraine. And they actually use the chemistry that we developed, that I talked about earlier in the talk, to make one mirror image of this molecule, Telsegipan, which you can use for, for migraine treatment. Now, it turns out um, there's a last part of organocatalysis that I, honestly I'm very proud of, but it's not something that we imagined and it's not something that we actually thought would, would come to pass. We didn't see this uh, happening. And we call this democratizing catalysis. So what does that mean? Well, it means that this type of catalysis is really, really inexpensive, is really cheap. And as a result of this, it's now being employed all over the world to actually both teach catalysis, but also for people to develop new types of chemical reactions. And this is happening in countries that are either wealthy countries or countries that are under-resourced. This is happening basically almost all over the whole planet. So when people ask me, where is the next big idea in organocatalysis going to come from? I always tell them, I don't know. But the one thing I do know, it's not going to be about who has the most money. It's going to be about who is the best idea. And I think that's something that is really, really fantastic. Okay, now, what does the future hold for organocatalysis? Well, honestly, I don't know the answer to that. But the one thing I do know is as our Earth's population continues to grow, we have to care more and more and more about sustainability. And that especially is going to come from catalysis. And at the present time, we have to spend more time thinking about things like organocatalysis, biocatalysis, photocatalysis, electrocatalysis, even main group or, or metal catalysis, metals that can be recyclable. We have to start thinking about using those too to make it so much more sustainable to allow the population of the earth to continue to grow. Okay, that was my last chemistry slide. I just always like to thank uh, my family. Uh, this is a, a recent photograph of my family. Um, one of the things I love about science it allows you to sort of travel the world. And this is as recently when we were lucky enough to be able to go down to Australia and visit. And this is my daughter and this is my wife. Uh, the other part I wanted to mention, I wanted to thank my mom and dad uh, who are no longer alive. But the part I like to mention here is uh, the Nobel Prize comes with a, a, a prize money. And one of the things that we've decided to do, myself and my wife, is to give that money to create a, a new foundation to allow uh, basically underprivileged students to go to university or colleges. We're trying to provide new opportunities for people to do that, which we're very excited about doing. And then last, I wanted to thank you for making the time uh, uh, to listen to this today. Uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to say that, you know, I, I really appreciate that you're listening, but I do want you to sort of know 
as much as I possibly, possibly can, that the, and I'm sure you do know this already, but I want you, it's really important you hear this again, that the world really, really does stand with Ukraine. And we everywhere want peace for that region. And we want Ukraine to be a country, the country that is the country that will always be. And you will always have our support in that, whether it's through science, whether it's through education, whatever. And I just want to extend to you that at any time in the future, if you ever want to contact me, if you're ever anywhere close to see me give a talk, or if you're in the United States, please reach out to me. I would love to meet with you. I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to talk about science and other things too. But ultimately, I just really want to thank you for attention and let you know that we, we all stand with Ukraine. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I hope we will meet you in Kiev uh, in one or two years with physical traditional lecture. So we have a lot of questions. Uh, I will ask, uh, first of all, questions about uh, the topic of your research and then some motivational and overall questions. So the question from Dmitro, is it possible that left-handed molecules suddenly transform to their right-handed uh, counterparts? So that can happen. It's, it can happen where some molecules can actually go back and forward between the two, which sounds kind of crazy. Sounds like science fiction. There are some molecules that can do that, and it's called dynamic stereochemistry. And some people have actually been able to use that to do a chemical reaction on one of the mirror images, but not on the other. But as long as they're flipping back and forward, they all get, it, get pulled in one direction to become a different molecule. So that's a, that's a really great question. And yes, they can go back and forward on some occasions. Most of the time, not, but sometimes they can. Okay, uh, the next question is from Darina. What is the role of catalysis in medicine? So in medicine, the, the major role is the fact that, um, well, number one, just to make bonds. <laughs> sometimes it's to make mirror images. Sometimes it's just to make bonds. So imagine that in a medicine, it's a quite complicated molecule. And maybe it takes um, many steps, many chemical reactions to make it. And then, so maybe that might take a month and may use a very large amount of energy to make enough for people, for society to use. But then imagine someone comes along and invents a new catalytic reaction. Instead of taking eight steps, it may happen in one step. And now instead of a month, you can make it in a day. So that is obviously very, very powerful because you reduce the energy, you reduce the time, you reduce the waste, you reduce the money, everything gets better. And that's what catalysis does. It changes the way you think about making all of the molecules, all of the materials around you and make them faster and better and easier. And that's where sustainability comes from. This idea of trying to make everything so much easier. Okay, the next question is from Yelizar. Are the blood groups also different because blood molecules are different uh, reflections of each other? Well, yeah, so even in your blood, um, your blood contains blood cells. Uh, they all are made up of these molecules that are one mirror image and not the other one. And what's really interesting is even on the surface of these blood cells, people don't know even to this day what some of the antigens are. And some of the, the research that we're now doing is trying to understand on blood cells uh, how to recognize those to determine what those antigens are. What are those molecules? And that would be really valuable information if we can sort of figure that out. So yeah, absolutely, blood molecules, or blood cells and are based upon these uh, single mirror images. Okay, uh, the next question is from Radomir. Uh, do you think, is it possible to do a symmetric inhibitor? Yes, absolutely. So an asymmetric inhibitor is the idea that you would uh, basically have one molecule versus the other one that would inhibit a given biological process. And that's absolutely a pathway that is that people work on. In fact, um, that's what many medicines exactly are now, where just say, for example, think about cancer. Uh, cancer often is a problem because you're tumor cells, your cancer cells are growing to, growing so fast, they're growing much faster than other cells. So they have these small molecules, which are single mirror images, which are tyrosine kinase inhibitors that can interact with 
basically these um, enzymes in cancer cells and slow them down. Slow them down so much that your body can remove the, the cancer cells. So these asymmetric inhibitors absolutely are very important. Okay, the next question is from Yulia. Uh, are there prospects for the development and the use of other types of catalysts? Yeah, so there's, I think if we think about the future, if you think about the next five to 10 years, we have to develop new types of catalysis. Uh, obviously, photocatalysis and electrocatalysis are really going to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but we have to come up with other types of catalysis that allow new ways of performing chemical reactions. Uh, we need that for sustainability, and we also need it for climate change. We absolutely need it for climate change. So it's very important that we develop those new types of catalysis. Okay, you mentioned about uh, the cancer and some illnesses. So uh, the next question is, Sophia, is can we uh, treat illnesses such as cancer using the catalyst, uh, catalysis? Well, we can. Uh, we use, well, we indirectly, yes. So we use catalysis to, to make uh, molecules, and these molecules can be then used to treat, um, to treat um, cancer. However, there's a new treatment that is just becoming more and more popular in cancer, and, and it's called um, PD-1, PDL one It's a very long name. And it basically is this way where a, a biologic, it's a large molecule, it acts as a catalyst to block the interaction between basically your cancer cell and your immune cell. And by doing that, it allows your immune cells to kill cancer cells. The reason why that's really important, it means like in much the same way that your body can get rid of the flu, or nowadays your body, because we take vaccines to get rid of COVID, we can now start to take these molecules which allow your immune system to get rid of cancer, which is an amazing, an amazing concept but it's all based upon catalysis. And it's a really remarkable new way of treating cancer. Uh, okay, the next question is from Dmitro. Uh, what is your current project? <laughs> uh, we have many current projects, um, but the ones I'm most, the ones we're working on, we're really excited about is what we're now using is catalysis with light, uh, with light. You may say, why would you want to use catalysis with light? But what's really crazy is if you have a catalyst and you shine just ordinary blue light on the catalyst, you know, I could shine blue light on my hand all day long, nothing would happen. But if I take a certain catalyst and shine light on it, that catalyst will become the equivalent of 32,000 degrees Kelvin, which is incredible. If you think about the energy of that, that's, that's incredible. But the catalyst will become 32,000 degrees Kelvin all the other molecules around it will be room temperature. And so with that, you can start to do some really new types of chemistry. But the type of chemistry we're most excited about, we can actually now put those catalysts on molecules and put those molecules into cells. And what we can do is shine light, the catalysts become the equivalent of 32,000 degrees, and they start to leave labels in the cell. And that's a bit like, leaving a label is like leaving your footprints wherever you go. And that's great because now we can start to understand the way that biological molecules, what they're doing, how they're interacting with each other. And for being able to understand diseases, this is really, really important. So we're very excited about this idea of using light and these catalysts to allow molecules to leave their footprints wherever they go. Okay, uh, now we can move to the second part of questions about your motivation and science and doing science overall. So uh, the question is from Makola. What are your favorite items about being a scientist? Well, it's, it's my favorite. Two, I have two things, maybe three things. So number one is being a scientist is that I am, I'm, an, I'm old. I'm, I'm 54 years old. I'm old. But every day I work with people who are between the age of 17 and 28. And, and they always stay that same age group. They're always the same age group. And I always get older because they, they, my group is always, uh, obviously new people, people leave, people come, but they always stay the same age. I always get older. So I always get to work with great young people, get great energy, get great creativity. That's extraordinarily exciting. 
That's number one. Number two is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things as being a scientist is whenever we develop a new chemical reaction. And it happens all the time. You'd be really surprised how, how easy it is. And my favorite part of that is that you discover a new chemical reaction. Maybe you discover on a Tuesday, a new chemical reaction. On a Monday, the world had no idea that this existed. And on a Tuesday, the world will know forever that that chemical reaction exists. And I love that. I think that's a really fantastic feeling to feel like you're involved in building science for the world and getting to see all these new things. So you're always around these new things which are happening all the time. And if you like new things, being a scientist is just truly wonderful, truly wonderful. Okay, the next question is from Kirill. Uh, how to become uh, a successful scientist? What is the most important uh, in this way? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say that the number one thing is to, to follow your own path. Um, you know, decide for yourself what you want to do for you. Uh, and, and that will help you. Try, don't, don't try and listen to everyone else telling you what to do. Try and decide for yourself what you're most excited about, what you want to do. I will say, though, one other part, which sounds like it's contradictory. Uh, I grew up in Scotland, and in Scotland, it's, it's, we're very, we really do listen to people who are older than us. I mean, I love listening to my, my, gram, my granddad, my grandmom. They tell you lots, of, my mom and dad, they tell you lots and lots of stories, and they've had lots of experiences. And that's really fantastic. People who are older than you can give you so much information because they've lived so much of life. So you should really, really listen to them. But at the same time, you take all of that information and you decide what you want to do with it based on your path that you want to follow. So I always believe that you should really listen to lots of people, but also be independent in terms of what you want to do. And then I think that will help you become a good scientist. But know who you are and know what it is you want to do to do sometimes that's not easy sometimes it's difficult it's confusing there's so much going on what should i do but i think what you should try and do is look at lots of things and try and feel what you're most excited about and going that direction okay uh, the next question is about your personal experience you said that you wrote 18 uh, letters to enter the phd but uh, only 19 was successful so uh, how did you overcome these challenges how what do you usually do when you give up or something uh, uh, goes wrong well i think it's it's one of those things in life that you just um, you know everyone it's easy to say well be determined um, everyone can say be determined but i think it's more like know know what it is that you want and try and never give up on what you want um, so for me it was always just this thing about i i just knew i always wanted to keep trying and trying and trying and trying to do that it was always something i was interested in and excited in and so that just keeps your motivation sort of high so i to, to my mind i think like the key thing there is don't let other people tell you you can't do something. Um, and especially don't let yourself tell yourself you can't do something. If you want to try and do something, uh, just decide that you're going to try and do it. And sometimes you'll feel like, oh, I'm not good enough or I'm an imposter. And you've just got to set those feelings aside and just go and try and do it. In my experience, when you do that, things are always a hundred times easier than you think they're going to be for example when i became an academic a professor i was very worried that you know i i was going to be a disaster because i didn't think i was close to being good enough but once you become an academic you realize it's so much easier than you think it's going to be and really most of the barrier to doing it is your own anxiety and apprehension about whether i'll be good enough so i think the key message there is don't tell yourself not to do something because of your own anxiety. Just give it a try. And very often you'll find it's, it's much more straightforward than you thought it was going to be. Okay. Uh, and we have a small tradition on our project. I ask the last question, what pieces of advice can you provide to Ukrainian scientists, uh, young scientists and school students who just start to make science and research? 
Well, if you're just starting to, to go into science and research, the, the, the number one thing I would tell you is that you're going to experience, uh, you're going to experience disappointment. You're going to experience failure. You're going to experience lots of, sort of negative emotions along the way. But you always have to keep reminding yourself that those, those failures, et cetera, those are just experiences. And remember, when you get to that moment of success, when you get that first time when something works, it's the most incredible feeling. And you have to sort of grab that feeling and sort of really hold on to it and tell yourself that you did that and you made the world a better place by that one time. And then every single time you do it thereafter, you're making the world a better, better place and always, always hold on to that feeling. So when you do science, keep that in mind. It's uh, being a scientist is one of the most important jobs in the world. If you think about scientists and engineers, we really care about humanity. We're all trying to make the world a better place and we can go to sleep at night feeling good about what we're trying to do for the world. Always hold on to that success and always hold on to that feeling that you're making the world a better place. Thank you very much for joining our project. We have a lot of questions, but we have, uh, usually we have limitation in time. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope to see you in Kiev. Welcome to our project again. Шановні учасники, всім дякую за те, що під'єдналися до нашої лекції. Нагадую, завтра о 16.00 на вас чекає чергова лекція. Розклад усіх травневих лекцій ви можете побачити на нашому сайті в розділі лекції майбутнього. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and goodbye. Thanks, Valeria.